Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well this morning. If you would, please go ahead and open up your Bibles to John's Gospel, and I'll join you there in just a moment. And I want to say as we begin this morning, Happy Easter. You know, as I was thinking about things, it's totally unfair. Christmas, as soon as the first snowflake hits the ground, we're putting up Christmas lights. We've got nativity on our mind. We're buying Christmas. We are in the Christmas season as soon as, maybe that's because wintertime there's not much to look forward to, maybe, right? But I think to myself, man, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important. It needs to have its own season. Did you know Easter is three weeks away? Are you ready? And uh, so what I did to kind of help prepare myself a little bit this last week was I read through each of the gospel accounts regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And a word struck me as I was reading each of these accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the word that struck me was this word, new. Resurrection is about new. I'll hopefully prove to you what I mean by that in the weeks to come. But as much as I believe the fact that the resurrection is all about things that are new, those of us who've been following Jesus for a minute or two, maybe that's not the first word that would come to our mind as we think about Easter, as we think about Resurrection Sunday. How would you describe Easter or Resurrection using one word? And be honest. Because I've struggled with that in the past as well. Would we use words like comfort? We've become very familiar with the resurrection story of Jesus Christ. Stale? The tomb's rolled away, he's risen. Dreadfully familiar? So the challenge then becomes, how do I, as a preacher of God's Word, how do I shake us awake to realize the weight and the gravity and the power, once again, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? How do I give you a, a fresh heart and, and open eyes and, a ready, and ready ears to receive and hear the message that Jesus Christ is alive? And the answer is, I can't. There's nothing that I can do to help you get a fresh perspective. The only thing that will help us in this moment as we prepare to celebrate Easter in a few short weeks is that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, to convict us, to encourage us, to inspire us, to give us a new satisfaction of hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And so uh, let me begin with prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, now as we uh, open your word, I pray, Father, that you would do an opening in our hearts and in our eyes and in our minds this morning. Give us a fresh perspective. Give us a new perspective this morning with the help of your Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us when we have taken for granted the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the greatest single event in human history. I pray here this morning that today would be the catalyst that we would begin to marvel yet once again at the resurrection of Jesus. In this moment, I pray that you will remove all distractions from us, that you would have a clear pathway to what it is you want to, uh, us to learn this morning. I pray these things in the living, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so let me just remind you a little bit about where we've been in John's Gospel as we get ready to come to John chapter 20. We left off last week, and where we left off last week, things were pretty bleak, pretty dark, pretty hopeless, definitely lifeless. As we learned in the weeks prior, uh, Jesus suffered on the cross. And in John chapter 19, verse 30, it records these words of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. It says, therefore, Jesus Christ, uh, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. 
And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Man, those are powerful, powerful words. It is finished. But for those of us who've been following Jesus for a while, um, we are familiar with those words. It is finished. Well, of course it is. But for those Christians who are living in the first century watching their friend, their teacher, their Savior hang on the cross and die, when they heard the words, it is finished, well, to them, Jesus might as well have said, I am finished. The disciples thought that with the death of Jesus, so too was the hope of anything that Jesus said or taught. That nothing that Jesus said was going to happen. But that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say, I am finished. Jesus said, it is finished. There's a big difference, I hope you understand, between um, being done and being finished. And uh, have you seen those food challenges on television where some restaurant or cafe uh, provides some ridiculous amount of food and an allotted amount of time? And for anybody willing to go forward and, and, and try the challenge, if you finish the meal in the allotted amount of time, then you get, congratulations, a free t-shirt and obesity. You know, I, it's crazy. It's crazy. What would happen if I went into that restaurant, I tried to complete the challenge, and I pushed my plate away and I said, I'm done. Is that the same thing as declaring, it's finished? No way. I'm done indicates that I've had my fill of that. I can't take it anymore. While it is finished indicates that the mission has been accomplished. And so when Jesus in John chapter 19 verse 30 declares to all those who are witnesses saying, it is finished, it's a declaration of victory. Mission accomplished. Goal achieved. He's saying that, by the way, and when he was finished, he didn't get some cheap, lousy t-shirt. What he did by dying on the cross was he dealt with all of humanity's sin for all time. And I want you to think about that and understand the gravity of that that was on his shoulders as he was on the cross. All of the past sin for all time leading up to that point. All of the present sin taking place even now. And all of the sin that is yet to be done. Jesus handled it all, forgave it all, removed it all, and said it's finished. But guess what? Such a heavy weight, such a big toll, that it cost Jesus his life. And Jesus, God in the flesh, is dead and it was like a sucker punch to the gut of the disciples, and they were unprepared for it. And so as we begin to talk through the resurrection this morning, this is where we need to start. Here's the fact of resurrection. It's needed. It was needed, and it still is needed. So Jesus is dead, and the followers of Jesus were left with, well, what do we do now? And two of Christ's disciples rose to the occasion, and that's where we left off last week. And I just kind of want to remind you about that. In John chapter 19, starting here in verses 38 uh, through 42, this is what it says. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission and so he came and he took away the body of Jesus. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds of weight. And so they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in the linen wrappings and with the spices, as it is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, 
They laid Jesus there. And last week we studied about these two secret, scared, sacrificial disciples, Nicodemus and Joseph. And these two were friends. These two were religious leaders. And these two finally came forward and professed and let people know that they loved Jesus more than anything. Even if it meant losing their reputation, losing some friends, losing their job, even if it cost them their life, they wanted people to know that they were followers of Jesus Christ. Well, that's a quick review of last week. And where we left off last week was verse 42. And verse 42 of John chapter 19 is very grim indeed. Because what you have to understand is that verse 42 begins the three days of silence where Jesus is in the tomb, where nothing is happening. There's no forward movement, no miracles, just rotting, decaying flesh and dead dreams. And it was a long three days. And so I hope you begin to understand that the disciples needed a resurrection. That after Jesus Christ died, think about what happened to those disciples in the moments after he died. What we're going to see as we're studying John chapter 20 and 21 is we're going to see that uh, their, the disciples were scared, they were scattered, and they were skeptical. That's what happened in the lives of the disciples. Yeah, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about the need for the disciples' need for a resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12, let me just read these for you, these verses. It says, Paul writes and he says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? By the way, there are a lot of people who believe that when you die, the end of the story is dirt for you. There's a lot of people who do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. But listen to what Paul says. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ is not raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and also your faith is in vain. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless and you are still living in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Here's a summary of what Paul is saying in these verses. Here's what he's saying as to why we need the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, if Christ is not raised, then the apostles are liars. Verse 15. So if Christ didn't raise from the dead and the apostles said, yeah, he did, I saw it with my own eyes, then they're liars. But here's the deal with that. If each one of the apostles were liars and a, a 10 out of the original 11 apostles all suffered painful, torturous, murderous death, and yet not one of them recanted. Not one of them said, oh, you know, know what? No, 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 no. I, 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 I was wrong. He's dead. He didn't raise back to life. Not one of them. Even every syllable of what they believed, they never recanted not even one syllable. Did they willingly die for a lie? Hardly. Second of all, if Christ is not raised, then Paul says, guess what, guys? Your faith is stupid. Verse 17 says, if Christ is not raised, your faith is worthless. That if Christ is not raised, then Christianity is the biggest hoax comparable to believing in the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. It's a child's fairy tale, is what he's saying. Thirdly, if Christ is not raised, then sermons are a waste of time. Verse 14, it says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. What are we doing here? Why are we not sleeping in or going out for brunch? 
Why have I devoted a lifetime of writing sermons and, and studying and then delivering them? Why are you gathered week after week faithfully listening to them if Christ is not raised from the dead? Fourthly, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then Christians are to be pitied. Verse 19, if Christ did not raise from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. Mr. T would be like, I pity the Christian, right? If Christ isn't raised from the dead, the world has every right to point a finger and say, look at those silly, pathetic Christians. They've deprived themselves of squeezing every ounce of joy that there is to be found in this life. We should be pitied. And finally, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then the most biggest tragedy of all, then death is the end. Verse 18 says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then those who have died in Christ have perished. See, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then your future is dirt. Dirt is what you have to look forward to. But if Christ is raised to life, then your future's not dirt. It's heaven. This is what I'll say about the resurrection and believing in it or trying to prove it. There's plenty of evidence to satisfy even the most sophisticated minds in human history that Jesus Christ is not dead, but that in fact he's alive. That he walked out of the tomb victoriously after being dead for three days. But here's the thing, the apostles and the early disciples needed a resurrection. And they needed it now. They were scared, they were scattered, they were skeptical. You understand, don't you, that Christianity, faith, is a well-set table. And that the resurrection is the centerpiece. It is the main dish. It is the thing that we've been waiting for. Everything else set on the table of Christianity is nice. It adds to it. But that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the thing. There is nothing else. And if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, everything else is meaningless and worthless. And here's what I need to say next. As much as those early disciples needed a resurrection, I have a sneaking suspicion this morning that you need a resurrection. What we're going to see, and this is, I'm so excited to study these last couple of chapters of John with you because now we get into the good stuff. With every encounter that Jesus has after he is resurrected, we're going to see that the resurrection changes absolutely everything. That every place that Jesus touches is made new. And if Jesus is dead, then so is the hope that anything will be different. So that asks, leads me to ask you this question, what area of your life needs some vitality, some life added to it? What area of your life is dead and cold right now? And it's been a long three days. And you need now more than ever, Jesus Christ to show up and breathe life into it. Is it your marriage? Is it your finances? Is it your loneliness? Is it your discouragement? Listen, resurrection is coming. So hold on. The fact is, though, that resurrection is needed. Here's the second thing. The experience of resurrection is new. And I've already touched on this a little bit. But Jesus' resurrection is why everything is new. Resurrection changes everything. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, it's the last book. It's the last, second to last chapter of the last book. This is what it says in verse 5. And he who sits on the throne has said... Oh, by the way, time out. Who is it that's sitting on the throne? Who is it that's saying these words? It's Jesus Christ. He was dead. He came back to life. And he ascended into heaven where he's sitting on a throne where he's ruling his kingdom. And this is what he says. Behold, I am making all things new. What does that include exactly? Uh, all things. 
whatever's old, whatever needs to be restored, whatever needs to be replaced, that's what Jesus Christ is making new. That's some good news. So new is the word that summarizes the whole of Christianity. Resurrection is new. By the way, I think it's no coincidence that Jesus was laid in a new tomb. All things are new with Jesus. And His death and His resurrection changes everything. Done with the old, into the new, off with the old, putting on the new. If you're a blood-bought son or daughter of Jesus Christ through your relationship of faith in Him, what's in your future is new. Three things that are yours because Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with Him as your Lord and Savior, these three things are yours that others do not have. Here's the first. New identity. Your past is the past. And Jesus makes all things new, including your identity. Listen to these verses this morning and be encouraged. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Are you in Christ? You're new. The past is the past. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Anybody in here this morning living with the guilt of the past? Got some regrets over some things that you've done? God's Word is saying, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. What's your identity before you came to Christ? What were you known for? before you came to Jesus Christ. An interesting thing that I think is worth studying sometime on your own is to think about uh, when Jesus Christ gets a hold of somebody's heart, how He changes their name. You ever notice that? Simon becomes Peter. The sons of thunder, James and John, we're not going to call them hotheads anymore. We're just going to call them James and John. Oh, and by the way, John, who used to be a hothead, who used to have a temper, is now going to write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which talk a lot, probably the most, about God's love. That's surprising. Think about Saul becoming Paul on the road to Damascus. How about Levi, the tax gatherer who used to swindle and cheat people? We know him better as Matthew. So what were you known for before you came to Jesus Christ? And what are you known for now? Man, they used to be so cheap and so tight with money and counting every penny. And now if there's a need, they're the first ones to give to that need. So generous. What changed? Jesus Christ makes all things new. And how much time do we waste looking in the rearview mirror of life with regrets New identity, that's the first thing that we get because Jesus Christ is alive. Here's the second thing, new purpose. New purpose. Before Christ got a hold of you, your purpose was to wring as much out of this life for yourself as you can. The most fun for yourself, the most money for yourself, the most popularity for yourself, the most enjoyment for yourself. It was all about me. But now when I came to Jesus Christ, guess what? I have a new purpose and I'm not living for self anymore. I'm picking up my cross daily. I'm dying to self and I'm living for Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why? Why Why were you created? To do some things that He had prepared in advance for you to do. Here's my question. Some of you have been followers of Jesus Christ a lot longer than I've been alive. Had you found your purpose in Jesus? I'm telling you, so much joy and so much satisfaction can be found when you are doing what it is He created you to do. And it's not all fun and games, but there's a joy, an ever-present joy that's there. And, you know, I've got friends who ask me, you know, if you weren't preaching, what would you do, Mark? Nothing. 
I have no talent. I, I can't do anything apart from preaching God's Word. And anything that I would attempt to do wouldn't bring as much satisfaction as serving Him because this is what I was created to do. And there's joy in it. Not always happiness, but joy. What's your purpose? Do you know it? Are you living it? You have a new purpose because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Here's the third thing that Jesus Christ gives because He's living, and it's a new hope. Do you know why the death of Jesus Christ is important? It's because our sins were forgiven on the cross. Do you know why the resurrection is important? Because it shows and proves that there is life after death and that if God has control over Jesus' resurrection from the dead, then He's going to have control over your death and your resurrection into heaven as well. It proves that there is life after this one. Talk about a new hope. A hope that things will get better with Christ's help. That my current problems will not be my future problems. What we're going to see is that as Jesus makes his appearance to his disciples and friends in the weeks to follow, it's this, that whatever Jesus touches, it's made new. That's the experience of the resurrection. And that's where we're going throughout the rest of John's gospel. We're going to see all things are made new. So the fact of resurrection, it's needed. Can we agree on that? Man, we need a resurrection. We need some hope here, God. The experience of resurrection, when I experience it, there's newness to be found. And then finally this morning, the faith of resurrection is now. When's the time to believe in the resurrection? Uh, now. So we come to John chapter 20, and we're late in the sermon coming to John chapter 20. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time unpacking and teaching from these verses. We're just going to simply read through John chapter 20, the first 10 verses. Next week, you come back next week, we'll teach you some things from these verses. But for now, let me just read verses 1 through 10. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, pause. Who's the other disciple that Jesus loved? John, thank you. And he's so humble, you know. He doesn't want to name himself by name. But what we're going to soon see is, where's your humility now, John? Because he says in verse uh, 2, So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 3, So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, neck and neck. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, is that a pertinent, important detail that we all need to know? Mm, probably not. But you've got to keep in mind, there was a competition between these two all the time. Who's the greatest among us? Who's the smartest among us? Who's the most dedicated among us? Who's the fastest? I got that one down. And so I imagine that as, as John is writing his gospel through the help of the Holy Spirit, as he's writing this down, the Holy Spirit's like, John, do you really need to include that? He says, oh, come on, let me include that. And the Holy Spirit was like, okay, fine, you can include that. Verse 5. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had, not, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their homes." Did you see there in verse 8, the author of this gospel that we've been studying now for over a year, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple who leaned on Christ's chest at the Last Supper, saw and believed. What does that indicate? Well, that tells us that during those three days when Jesus was in the tomb, 
When there was silence from God, when there was no movement from God during that time, something was happening to John's faith. It was struggling. His faith was difficult. It was stagnant. He probably was, like all the other disciples, wrestling with his doubts. And then it happened. He was confronted with the resurrection of the empty tomb. And he believed. And what's interesting to me is that everything that you've been going through in your life is leading up to this moment. There are no coincidences with God. There's no ha happenstance with God. Everything that you've been going through in your life is leading up to this moment now that we're having together. John went in and he saw and he believed. And I want to conclude our time together with a video that I came across this last week that I was kind of doing some work on the Monday, Thursday service that we're going to be having uh, uh, later on. Um, but I was looking for a video to show for that. This is not the video that we're going to show for that service. But this video was very good. And I was by myself and I was struck with the love of Jesus Christ and the compassion that He had. And I hope this morning that now is the time for you to believe in the resurrection and in the empty tomb. That Jesus was more than just a godly man, that he was more than just a moral teacher. There was something more to him, and the, what was more to him was this, he was God. And he died, and that was important. But he resurrected back to life, and that was even more important. Let's watch this video this morning. And uh, then we'll conclude with the rest of our service. Let's kill all of the lights if we can, so we can focus this morning on the screen before us. I don't know you. I don't know what you have said to be put here. I know little about your teaching. I don't know why I treat you like this when you remain in silence. I don't know. You are this. I am not. You are the Messiah. Come to us. Save yourself and us. Right now. With your name. Do you not fear God when you are sent to die? We deserve to die for our crime. This man has not done anything wrong. Don't you know who you're talking to? Don't you know what he's done? Yes, I do. Here's what I'm trying to tell you here this morning. The fact of the resurrection, the experience of the resurrection, and the faith in the resurrection is coming at a specific moment in time. It's been coming for a long time. God's been planning for it. He's been accounting. He's been protecting it. It's been coming for a long time. It lasts forever, but faith in the resurrection comes in a moment of time for you. 
And so this is where we leave this morning. Uh, Have you had your moment? Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ made a difference in your life? Today it can. Let's stand together. We're going to pray and then we'll sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to gather together and to um, study your word. And I'm thankful for those who week after week so faithfully do that. God, forgive us again at times when we have taken for granted the power of the resurrection. Thank you for what it means to us. Thank you for being a God willing to prove yourself to us. And my prayer here this morning, Father, is specifically that this Easter season would be different for us than all those in the past. That the same power that rose Jesus Christ back to life be experienced in each of our lives as well. And that the hope that is ours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Father, that we would cling to that hope and that we would find joy in that hope and that we would share that hope with a lost and dying world. Thank you again for all the things that you've done for us and for your patience with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.